is a rude awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll speak to Friends of the Congo Executive Director Maurice Carney on the decimation of the land in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and California Youth versus Big Oil on their latest efforts to point Governor Gavin Newsom in the right direction. But first, the news. I'm Eileen Alfandari with KPFA News Headlines. President Biden is in Poland for meetings with U.S. troops, Poland's president, and humanitarian groups. Poland has received the bulk of the estimated 3.6 million Ukrainian refugees who have fled their country since Russia invaded a month ago. Yesterday, Biden held a series of meetings with NATO and European Union leaders. Biden and the EU announced a deal to ship more U.S. liquefied natural gas supplies to Europe to replace that which is or has been sent by Russia. The United States, together with our international partners, they're, we're going to work to ensure an additional 15, 1, 5, 15 billion cubic meters of liquefied natural gas, LNG, for Europe this year. And as the, Euro, as the EU works to discontinue it buying Russian gas well before 2030, it will also, will also work to uh, ensure additional EU market demand for 50 billion cubic meters of LNG from the United States annually by 2030. Biden said the U.S. would also work to double down on achieving clean energy goals for Europe, but climate groups denounced plans to build new infrastructure and markets to receive U.S. natural gas supplies. One climate group said that building new import terminals would need locking in fossil gas imports for years to come, long after the European Union needs to quit this climate wrecking fuel for good. Meantime, Russian officials say the attempt to change its behavior through the use of sanctions won't work. Stuart Smith reports on the remarks of the security defense chairman. The deputy chairman said the West's assumption that by limiting Russian business it could somehow influence the government was fundamentally flawed, that none of them are able to change the position of Russia's leadership in the slightest. His comments came after the US, Canada, Japan and Australia imposed fresh sanctions on Thursday, variously against lawmakers, defence companies, so-called media propagandists, car manufacturers and shipbuilders. Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson Maria Zakharova accused the US of virtually stealing foreign exchange reserves and warned what she called the U.S. economic war threatens to bring down bilateral relations. Stuart Smith, Moscow. Ukrainian authorities in the besieged southern port city of Mariupol say about 300 people died in a Russian airstrike on a theater where hundreds of civilians were sheltering. It wasn't immediately clear whether emergency workers had finished excavating the theater or whether the death toll would rise. Russia's military claimed it had destroyed a massive Ukrainian fuel depot used to supply the Kyiv region's defenses, with ships firing a salvo of cruise missiles at it. The outskirts of the second largest city, Kharkiv, were shrouded by foggy smoke with constant shelling. An Al Jazeera reporter said Russia was using cluster bombs and showed on camera a bomblet he had picked up in a Kharkiv schoolyard. In Chernihiv, where an airstrike this week destroyed a crucial bridge, a city official said a humanitarian catastrophe is unfolding as Russian forces target facilities storing food. Conservative activist Virginia Thomas the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas exchanged more than two dozen text messages with White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in the weeks after the presidential election. Thomas urged him to act to overturn the results. The Washington Post and CBS obtained copies of 29 messages the pair exchanged in the week after former President Trump's loss. The Post reported that on November 10th, three days after the election, Thomas texted Meadows, quote, help the 
this great president stand firm, Mark? You are the leader with him who is standing for America's constitutional governance at the precipice. The majority knows Biden and the left is attempting the greatest heist of our history. Thomas urged that lawyer Sidney Powell, who had promoted false claims about the election, be the lead and the face of the Trump legal team seeking to overturn the election outcome. Meantime, Clarence Thomas, who has been hospitalized since last Friday with an infection, has been released today. After more than 30 hours of hearings, the Senate is on track to confirm Ketanji Brown Jackson as the first black woman on the U.S. Supreme Court. The big question is whether any Republicans will vote for her. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell said yesterday he will be a no vote. And nothing we saw this week convinced me that either President Biden or Judge Jackson's deeply invested far left fan club have misjudged her. I will vote against this nominee on the Senate floor. Democrats can confirm Jackson on their own in the 50-50 Senate since Vice President Kamala Harris can cast the tie-breaking vote. Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Dick Durbin, who has been privately lobbying Republican colleagues to support Jackson, said Republicans who attacked her during two days of questioning were testing their party's political messaging for the November election. But Durbin said he still hopes some Republicans will vote to confirm Jackson. I sincerely hope, I really hope, not just because I want to make sure she's on the court, that we will have a bipartisan support for her nomination. If this turns out to be a strictly partisan vote with this historic opportunity, it'll be sad. Sad for our country and sad as a commentary on where the parties are today. I'm hoping, I'm still hoping, that several Republicans, I hope many more, will step forward and support her nomination. I'm disappointed with Senator McConnell's decision, but I'm not surprised. The Senate Judiciary Committee is expected to vote on Jackson's nomination on April 4th, setting up a confirmation vote by the full Senate later in the month. Hundreds of thousands of California tenants facing eviction could get another three months of protection. California's eviction protections for people who have already applied for rental assistance but not received it expires next Thursday. Now the state assembly and state Senate leaders are endorsing a bill that would extend those protections protections through June 30th. Assembly members Tim Grayson and Buffy Wicks, both of whom are Bay Area Democrats, introduced a bill that would extend eviction protections for people with pending applications through the end of June. North Korea says it test-fired its biggest yet intercontinental ballistic missile this week. The North said the launch came as a result of the orders of leader Kim Jong-un, who vowed to continue expanding his nuclear arsenal while preparing for a, quote, long-standing confrontation with the U.S. Weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, mostly cloudy in the morning, then becoming sunny with highs in the 60s around the bay, the upper 70s inland, and Fresno in the central San Joaquin Valley, mostly sunny with a high near 87 degrees. I'm Eileen Alfandiri. More news in 94.1 with headlines at noon, 3 and 4. Join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. Welcome back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. The Democratic Republic of the Congo has been under constant environmental attack and exploitation for generations through mining and now logging um, that has been disrupting the, the carbon sequestering peatlands. And it's important to keep in mind that not only has the environment been under constant withering attack, but so have the people of the Congo who have been stewards of the land for thousands and thousands of years. And to Today, we're going to get an overview of what is happening in the DRC. And here to talk about it is Mr. Maurice Carney. He is the executive director of Friends of the Congo. And uh, he has been at it for over a decade, coming up on two decades. Um, he is a Congo expert. He is a Congo expert, expert on the DRC. Mr. Maurice Carney, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. It's my pleasure. My pleasure to be with you, Sabrina. All right. So, um, so of course, this is a climate crisis show, and uh, we want to talk about uh, we want to talk about the peatlands. We want to talk about the logging. We want to talk about the you know the mining uh, that has been going on, and uh, just give an overview of 
of the mining, uh, the multinational corporations that are coming in, disrupting the land, disrupting the way people live. Now the logging, uh, disrupting these peatlands. Um, talk to us about. It. Give us and give our folks an overview who are not aware, probably not aware of what is happening in the DRC. Go ahead. Sure, sure. You know, uh, Sabrina, the, the DRC for uh, the last few hundred years uh, has been a space uh, uh, on the African continent uh, uh, that's been relegated to that of a source of extraction. You know, whether we're talking about extraction of human beings, extraction of natural resources, and extraction uh, at the expense of the masses of, uh, of Congolese, um, you know, from the modern founder of the country, which wasn't designed by the Congolese themselves, but by Europeans in the late 1800s, where rubber uh, was uh, and ivory were the, the key uh, resource, resources that were being uh, plundered uh, by European powers, which led to an estimated 10 uh, to 15 million uh, Congolese who perished within a 23-year period from 1885 to 1908. Uh, so uh, fully understand the Congo, uh, you have to put it in this context that this design uh, where the riches, uh, where the bounty of the land uh, was used uh, by external forces uh, at, uh, to the tremendous uh, detriment of the Congolese population. Uh, mm-hmm. And looking at the Congo in that context and understanding that framework, uh, you get a uh, an appreciation uh, for the devastation that's taking place today, uh, whether it's by uh, different uh, multinational corporations, whether from the West or the East, uh, whether uh, it's by neighboring countries. Uh, we see that as a result of uh, Congo's riches, that uh, it's been uh, preyed upon by uh, predators from, from all walks of life. And that's what we see unfolding um, today. You know, whether you mentioned uh, the whole um, matter of uh, Congo's rainforest. And, uh, you know, the, the Greenpeace had produced a, a study a number of years back called uh, Carving Up the Congo. They stated that uh, the Congo risks losing up to 40% of its, uh, of its forests uh, as a result of uh, transport infrastructure from, uh, from logging and uh, on roads and uh, major multinational corporations going in and uh, de- depopulate or, or cutting down trees. Uh, uh, so uh, th- that gives you, uh, it's just a glimpse really into yet another area of, uh, uh, of plunder that we see in the, in the Congo, uh, whether we're talking about the logging itself uh, whether we're talking about the mining, the mining of the minerals that many of us are familiar with now, the uh, the cobalt and the copper and the coal tan and all, even in the 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 mining, the industrial mining sectors, you find major corporations like uh, Glencore, uh, one of the largest uh, multinational corporations in the uh, commodities uh, sector, uh, as they extract resources, uh, they pollute the land, uh, uh, the waters and uh, and uh, the that are used by local local population. Uh, so, or even if we look at one of the major uh, uh, the, uh, gold mining companies, uh, Banra out of Canada and Anglo Gold Ashanti out of South Africa, where they just lay waste uh, to uh, acres and acres of uh, of land as they they do uh, their mining to extract. The natural um, extract gold and uh, other natural resources. So unfortunately, uh, that's been uh, the story of uh, the Congo that has been, it's served as a source of extraction for the benefit of quote unquote modern society. Uh, starting, you know, uh, in the last hundred years or so, uh, from rubber right on down to today where we see uh, uh, cobalt uh, being extracted for the benefit of uh, Electra, electric vehicles and uh, uh, rechargeable batteries that we all use and benefit from. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, we're talking rubber, we're talking diamonds, uh, gold and cobalt, um, and it's it's a 
It's just, it's, it, the Congo is full of, it's a, it's a wealth, it's a wealth of natural resources. Um, and there are a lot of uh, organizations that are, are trying to fight against this. Um, but mm-hmm. there is this connection um, which leads to this disconnect between the land and the people that are there that have been, uh, you know, agroecologically um, farming the land, living off of the land. Um, now they're dealing with all of this pollution. Talk to us about that political aspect of um, the people that are of that land that are allowing mm-hmm. for all of this uh, mining and now logging to, to take place. Talk to us about that. Well, uh, you know, the the country itself uh, is a, a mixture of some over some 400 uh, different uh, groups um, that or peoples, I guess you can you can call it. And uh, unfortunately, the the state uh, doesn't do an adequate job of protecting the interests of uh, the population and maybe it wasn't designed to do so uh, in the first place uh, I mean, it was designed really to serve as an intermediary uh, between uh, finance capital in the west and uh, the population itself uh, not in terms of governing the population but basically reigning over the population to assure that uh, the extractive process um, continues um so uh, that puts uh, the population in a, in a situation uh, where, uh, for example, if we look at the, the Twa people, uh, the so-called um, pygmies uh, who inhabit the, the forest land, they are left exposed uh, to multinational corporations who uh, come in and uh, for all intents and purposes just, um, take the land uh, in that same Greenpeace uh uh, report and they talked about uh, land being appropriated from the local population for bags of sugar or salt uh, just for uh, for nothing and uh, in instances uh, instances um, Sabrina where the people do rise up and do resist um, for example there's an American co- corporation called Blattner out of um, Pennsylvania and they're heavy into logging in the Congo and really have you know, logging plantations. And uh, the local population in uh, the northeast part of the Congo call, uh, near Kisangani, had uh, risen up uh, to, to resist uh, the uh, setting up of plantations uh, by, uh, by this corporation and came under, you know, weathering uh, uh, attacks. Uh, the, uh, the Nation magazine had uh, published a, a, a report um, by Christian uh, Parenti a number of years ago uh, that documented the bravery and part of these uh, the local population in the area in terms of resisting these logging plantations. So uh, you find this, you find uh, where instances where people are being taken advantage of uh, to the extreme, and then uh, you find uh, occasions where the Congolese uh, people who are often left to their own devices. Uh, resist uh, and uh, in some instances are, are victorious in, in driving out these companies that are coming in to appropriate uh, their resources in this instance uh, uh, lumber and and even recently we had a situation where the International Court of Justice uh, said Congo was entitled to 300 million dollars or the rule of Congo is entitled to 300 million dollars from their neighbor uh, Rwanda, I'm sorry, Uganda, the Ugandan government uh, who had been documented by the United Nations as uh, a plunder in Congo's uh, uh, lumber and timber and uh, exporting it out through Uganda uh, to uh, to multinational corporations in other countries. Wow. Okay, so so they were trafficking that lumber out? Is that what you're saying? Uh, they, they were, they, uh, well, the United Nations published three reports uh, from two, uh, three from 2000, uh, one, and around two, in 2001, uh, entitled uh, The uh, Illicit uh, Explo- Exploitation of Congo's Natural, Resource, natural Resources. And uh, we have that, uh, the reports on our website at friendsofthecongo.org. And in those reports, they, they basically said that uh, the president of uh, Uganda, Yuri Museveni, and the president of Rwanda, 
Kokodami are the the mafia uh, dons of the Congo. In the case of uh, Uganda, uh, the network had a network where both uh, timber and gold were being plundered in the Congo. And th this is a result of uh, a war that both nations, so a series of wars that both nations imposed on the Congolese people. And as a result of the uh, uh, those wars, the bounty that they got, uh, Rwanda, I mean, Uganda got uh, gold, primarily gold and timber. Uh, Rwanda in the east of the con country uh, got uh, primarily, you know, coltan and, and tin uh, out of, uh, as a result of the, the not only the, the wars that uh, they've imposed on the Congo, but they actually occupied the country for uh, a number of years as well. So what, what that shows is the the uh, multiplicity of challenges that the Congolese people face uh, because of their riches, and it's those riches uh, draw uh, the worst characters that you can um, think of. And then you have uh, neighboring countries, you have um, rebels, you have uh, major multinational corporations, uh, you have hedge, hedge funds who finance um, individuals in in their uh, to to corrupt the Congolese government so that uh, companies can get uh, you know uh, concessions or pennies on the dollar as was the case with Arch Ziff uh, hedge fund here in the United States that the, the US Department of Justice uh, fined uh, I think uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because uh, they had given about a hundred million dollars or so to uh, an Israeli businessman who was subsequently sanctioned by uh, the United, the Department of uh, Treasury, his name is Dan Gertler, uh, giving him about $100 million or so to corrupt Congolese government officials so that they can get access to natural, to concessions uh, uh, for their, uh, for the, the, the partner companies in the Congo. So it, it's just a, a web of, uh, of powerful forces uh, throughout the globe who are drawn to the Congo and uh, in the exploitation of uh, the wealth of uh, resources that are there uh, for the benefit of, uh, of uh, corporations and external forces at the expense of the Congolese people who live, the overwhelming majority of whom who live in less than $2 a day, uh, uh, living in extreme poverty, uh, less than 10% have access to electricity. Uh, you, you know, healthcare is non-existent. Uh, even a, a basic uh, road infrastructure uh, is barely uh, present throughout throughout the country. Um, so it has uh, the country itself has continued to serve um, Sabrina as an outpost uh, for the extraction of uh, uh, resources. Uh, the only things that have changed are the players um, over the over the years, the decades, and the centuries, and the uh, the different resources that keep uh, being discovered. In the in the Congo, uh, over you know whether it was rubber at the start of the twentieth uh, uh, century, or uh, you know as I said, cobalt and coltan at the start of the twenty first century, but the the design and the, the outcomes uh, remain uh, intact, unfortunately, and that's one of the things that uh, friends of the Congo and our partners on the ground are are fighting to change. Right, most definitely, most definitely, and it's it's a fight that has been ongoing for, for it seems like centuries. My goodness, I mean, I it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to hear that the people are rising up, and I, I appreciate the the description of the web, you know, the the web of extractivism that has been in place and put in place. Um, we look back to the, the the history of how the Congo was was formed. You know, it was basically formed for those reasons, initially for gold and diamond extraction. Um, and now it's it's turned into, uh, it, it's, it's stayed a gold mine, I should say. I shouldn't say it's turned into, but it has stayed a gold mine mm -hmm. for these multinational corporations and for us living in the West that uh, have, have now, you know, fashioned our lives around that dependency, um, which yeah. is absolutely. And you, you, and you, mm -hmm. you know, Sabrina, the fascinating thing about the Congo, I know we talk about the minerals and 
uh, we talk about, uh, you know, the timber and all, but we, we are talking about a country that could serve as the breadbasket for the entire African continent. Uh, the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, you know, seeing that we're talking about the land and the people and people being displaced, not being able to live or to farm, what have you. Uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization said Congo has an agricultural, agricultural potential, right, mm -hmm. to feed the increase of the world population from today till 2050, which is expected to be about 2 billion people, which is twice the population of the African continent, about a billion people. So even if the people were left to their own devices and uh, were to just uh, develop a sustainable agricultural system, they could feed the entire African continent twice over. Um, so it's not only the... Uh, what's being stolen in the immediate is the potential that's being robbed on a consistent basis uh, because of the, uh, the, the theft and the plunder that breeds instability and insecurity and prevents uh, the human potential uh, of the 90 million plus Congolese people from being fully realized. So there's this intricate link uh, between the despoilation of the land, the plunder of the land, inability of the people to own and control the land, and maximize the use of the land uh, to uh, their their ability to live uh, a quality uh, life, uh, uh, not only uh, as Congolese, but really for, for Africans as a, as a whole, especially when we start talking about land and food security. Now that's a shame. That is beyond a shame. I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> wow, that, that is some amazing information and, and a fact that cannot be denied. Now, you've got the UN, you mentioned the UN, um, but there, it's not as if they're, they're waging any type of real substantive battle against these multinational corporations. You know, and we have to, you know, we have to ask that question, you know, why is that not happening? You know, they, they've got their folks and, you know, they're in their suits and, and ties and, you know, and their dress shoes and they're, they're going to, to, to work and putting their information, you know, put, putting the information out there, researching it, getting the data, putting it out there, publishing it. But that's as far as it goes. You know, it, it, and it doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, we're talking about the United Nations. They have a whole army of people that are supposed to be protecting yeah. people that are supposed to be yeah. protecting the land, that are supposed to be protecting them, United Nations. It's in the name, United Nations, not United Corporations. But that's that's what, you know, has been on display. I mean, we look back at what happened at COP or what didn't happen at COP26. It's an absolute joke at this point. We've got agro. I mean, yeah. the, the whole continent of Africa is being decimated by these uh, right. multinational yeah. corporations, as well as these full organizations that are supposed to be promoting this so-called green revolution. The, all they're doing is decimating wow. uh, the, 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 the system of agroecology which has been in place for a millennia right so you know it's it's the conversation stops you know once the information is out there here's the data but we're not going to do anything about it um why right. and, and you know sabrina that point is so critical because if we were to go into the u.n that'll take an entire the show um but this that's why your show and uh shows like yours are so critical because what what is what is happening is that we're taking this information right mm -hmm. uh that may, mainly corroborates what those local activists and justice seekers on the front line inside the Congo have been saying and continue to say. So what we have to do is leverage networks such as yours, connect those on the front lines in the Congo with folks uh, on the outside who uh, have access to pressure points, whether it's to investment funds, uh, whether it's to public policy officials. I think the extent to which uh, we can continue to make those connections and expand them and put pressure at the right places uh, that that can uh, ultimately make a, a, a difference. Not only put pressure at the right places, but also use these networks to leverage resources that can go to people on the front line. So we have people on the front line, networks that we have, and connecting 
uh, the networks outside of the Congo, to the folks on the front line in, in, in the Congo, as they wage this battle to transform uh, the condition that they face uh, on the ground. And in their being successful, uh, to tra in transforming their con the conditions on the ground, that benefits us all as, uh, as a global family. Because as you know, as you've shared on this show before, I'm sure, that Congo is a part of the second largest rainforest in the world. And it's vital in the fight against uh, climate, uh, climate change. So we have to uh, leverage uh, the access and uh, networks that we have here uh, to support our, our brothers and sisters on the front lines in the Congo. That's a uh, critical uh, path in terms of uh, a solution. I know we talk about all the problems and the challenges, but that is uh, definitely one solution that we all can play a role in uh, in helping to to make a difference uh, locally in the Congo, uh, continent wide, and uh, the benefits uh, will redound uh, to us uh, to humanity as a whole. Most definitely, friends of the Congo, friends of the Congo dot org, friends of the Congo dot org. Um, so. Again, folks, this is a general conversation about what is going on, the decimation of the land in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And I'm speaking with Maurice Carney, and he's giving us a general overview of what has been happening there. Um, and it's, it's, it's the disconnect. I cannot disconnect from that disconnect. <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah, right. that's, why, that's why I shared with you. We're going to get one of those front lines folks on with you so you could speak to them directly and have them, you know, get access to your, uh, to your, to your listeners so they can hear directly from folks on the ground in the Congo. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's just, it's so sad. I mean, we're talking pollution of the water. We're talking about the mm -hmm. logging. Um, I think that's the latest thing that has been on the uh, on the front page. Uh, the New York Times just mm -hmm. came out with an amazing article that you sent to me, Maurice. I appreciate that because it's mm -hmm. extensive. The um, New York Times is in place. So I got to compliment them on this because they really did a deep, deep, deep dive. They were there on the front lines. They were trudging through the swamplands where the peat is, mm -hmm. and, you know, just giving... The, the, amazing pictures amazing photos of um how these logging companies are just just taking care taking over uh the local loma local loma uh area of the drc which is in the congo basin and folks you can go to that it's uh the title of that article is what do the protectors of congo's peatlands get in return that's dated february 21st 2022 what do the protectors of the congo's peatlands get in return by ruth mclean and caleb gabanda and it's just it is amazing it is it's a devastating read it truly is and folks if you're not aware uh what's happening is that the logging is happening and then uh it's um it's uh, disrupting the peat. Um, peat is an efficient mm -hmm. way to store carbon. And it stores twice as much carbon as uh, the forest. And uh, it's known as Ntoku, Ntoku in, uh, in the Congo, in DRC. So that is the latest level of decimation that they are facing there. And uh, there is a, a fight being waged against that as well. So... Um, if you want to get more information, again, folks, you can go to Friends of the Congo, Friends of the Congo .org. Um, Maurice and his team, they're constantly, constantly uh, putting out information um, about what is happening. Uh, they've got a major, and they're based in Washington, D.C., so they have a major, major connections in the Congo with folks on the front lines. I cannot wait to have a conversation with uh with one of those folks two of those folks three of those folks to to bring it out to to let folks know you know hey this is how your uh this is how your cell phone is being powered this is how your laptop is being powered mm. you know it's it's and it's hard it is so hard we're so connected to our devices nowadays you know it's um but to 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 continue in the 21st century in this trajectory is not the way to go there can't there can the, yeah. the level of greed you know that's a whole hmm. other story <laughs> you know that, that, that we need to understand and realize that it, it doesn't it can be these you know connections to not decimating the land and still living the way that we're living 
I think, I don't know, <laughs> I'm trying to get information <laughs> out there, but there's got to be a better way than the way that it's being done now. The people, the people of the Congo cannot live the way that they've been living. There's no way I'd be able to live off of two dollars a day. I've done it, but you know, like it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not sustainable. Not at all. You know, it's not sustainable at all. So, um, Maurice, I'm going to go ahead and let you close this out. Are there any uh, other thoughts you want to add to our conversation today, Mr. Maurice Carney, Executive Director of Friends of the Congo? Sure. J- just uh, to thank you, uh, thank you, listening audience, uh, for continuing to. Uh, tune in, support your work, support uh, the work of Friends of the Congo, and uh, most importantly, to to let people know that uh, there are folks on the ground who are uh, resisting and who are seeking justice. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of agency uh, being exercised by Congolese themselves uh, at the local level. Uh, and uh, to to be frank, um, Sabrina, if uh, the work and the ideas that are being produced at the local level uh, were to be scaled <laughs> and get the support uh, that they that they need. Uh, the, the, these problems would be uh, will be dealt with uh, forthright, uh, without without a doubt. Uh, so that's part of the challenge as well, um, piercing through the veil and getting the support where uh, it needs to be at the local level, where there are tremendous ideas uh, being acted upon. Uh, but uh, they're not being scaled to the level that uh, that's uh, commensurate uh, with the grandeur and uh, effectiveness of the work that's being that's being done by local population. So, uh, to the extent that we can get support to them, uh, to folks on the local level, is the same degree to which uh, the Congo can uh, can change, uh, African change, and we as a global community can can benefit and reap the benefits of that that work that's being done on the ground. Most definitely. And uh, again, where's the UN? <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> Where are they? This should yeah. not just be on the backs. This should, this should not be a burden of just people of the Congo to defend themselves. You know, I mean, if, ah, okay, we could go on. Don't get me started. I think you already did. I tell yeah. you, it's just. Uh, yeah heartbreaking but um there is hope there is hope there is light yeah inspiring it is say heartbreaking and inspiring at the same time absolutely absolutely look yes. at the pause check out friends of the org. i tell you yeah. Walter scarney i appreciate you being on the show it's so wonderful to have another conversation with you looking forward to more conversations definitely want to drill down on what's happening in the congo basin and uh talk to the folks yes front line so i'll be i'll be hitting you up real soon i appreciate all right all right thank you appreciate you as well This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. We're going to switch gears here and talk about some actions that are coming up uh, and actions that are in full effect as we speak, folks. Um, April 8th, there's going to be actions across the state of California uh, mobilizing for no new permits, no new permits to drill oil. And also in Sacramento, there will be a gathering uh, of these postcards and uh, mentioned it last week with Alex Messi. I actually have her back on the line here to talk about uh, what's going to be happening on the 8th, uh, printing out those postcards and, and presenting them to the governor's staff. Now, these postcards are from folks who were able to get to the website, uh, several websites that have been sponsoring this whole action to say, hey, Governor Newsom, we don't want any more drilling in our state. There shouldn't be any more drilling here in the state of California. And uh, I've got three amazing folks, three amazing folks on the line right now, including Alex Massey. Now, Alex Massey is an 
18 year old climate activist from Ventura County who goes to UC Berkeley and is a coordinator with California Youth versus Big Oil. And she's worked on the No New Permits and 32 Foot Setback Campaigns. Welcome, Alex. We also have a 19 year old Ventura County climate activist, Molly McCloy, and she's also a coordinator with California Youth versus Big Oil and has been involved with the West Side Clean Air Coalition and Climate First, replacing oil and gas. And then we've got, of course, Supriya Patel, and she's a 16 year old climate organizer based in Sacramento, and she's the founder of Fridays for Future Sacramento, and I coordinator with California Youth versus Big Oil. Good people, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Welcome, welcome. And Alex, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Sabrina. And uh, I want to invite my uh, fellow coordinators to say hey as well. So thank you all for having us. Yeah, I'd like to uh, echo Alex's sentiment. Uh, Thank you so much, Sabrina, for having us on to talk about uh, California Youth versus Big Oil's uh, next steps. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies, for, for, for being on the show. And let's see here. Let's, um, Alex, you're a veteran as far as I'm concerned on the show now. So we'll go ahead and start with you. Um, talk to us about, because I, I've, I've, I've been in receipt of several different emails. Um, it's gotten a little bit confusing. Uh, folks that are fl- following what's going on as far as uh, any climate actions, because people are getting geared up. They've got their plans. Extinction Rebellion's got all kinds of stuff that's happening all over the globe and of course here in the bay area with our own organization um you've got your organization california youth versus big oil doing a lot um talk to us about the 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 upcoming rallies and what should we should be focusing on here in uh, the bay area something you know let us know about what we can get involved with go ahead and then throw it to your colleagues once you finish of course Absolutely. So thank you for, um, again, inviting us on to talk about no new permits. So essentially what no new permits is as a whole is a way for Californians to express to Governor Newsom that we want no more fossil fuel drilling in California. Uh, We've seen Governor Newsom make moves to that are in support of what um, frontline communities and environmental allies have been asking for, such as that 3,200 foot uh, setbacks campaign. But what we really want is a further step towards this, which is committing to no new fossil fuel drilling. So to talk a little bit more about what these actions are to express Californians' desire for no more fossil fuel drilling, I'll pass it to Sapria to explain what these um, actions will be. Yeah, thank you, Alex, and thank you for having me today. So on April 8th, there is going to be a distributed day of action across the state, and we are going to be putting on actions to demand that Governor Newsom stops approving new fossil fuel permits. So here in Sacramento, where I am based, we are going to be having an action that is going to be at the California State Capitol, and we are going to be delivering postcards from folks across the state to Governor Newsom's staff that are calling on Governor Newsom to take action on this crisis. We also have another action that's coming up on March 25th that is put on by the Pomo Land Back Campaign, and they're going to be fighting for Indigenous sovereignty. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go to pomolandback.com. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I've definitely spoken to um, Chairman Michael Hunter and uh, have been uh, keeping everybody abreast of what's been happening there at the Jackson Demonstration State Forest. And it is sad and exciting all at the same time. So yeah, we definitely want to keep folks abreast of what's happening there. Hope to have them back on as well. Uh, Now, as far as with the... uh, Letter writing camping, Molly. We haven't heard from you, Molly McCoy. And uh, let's talk about um, let's talk about what this uh, letter writing campaign is going to be consisting of. Um, so or, it's still happening now. So today, the twenty fifth, is uh, the all of these these postcards are supposed to be printed out. That's what I heard. Talk to us about that. Thanks. Yes. So the uh, postcard 
cards are a way for Californians to express their exhaustion with fossil fuels and to demand and encourage Governor Newsom to end all fossil fuel permitting. Uh, postcards are a fun way for Californians anywhere to get involved with climate activism. Um, it is super simple. You can go to tinyurl.com slash California Youth versus Big Oil or CAYB. BO cards to send a postcard of your own and to demand Governor Newsom stop at all new fossil fuel permitting. All right. And how long has this uh, how long has this campaign, this letter writing campaign been going on? Because I heard I heard about it about two weeks ago or a week ago or so. Um, and yeah, give us a little bit more information as far as that letter writing campaign. Molly, go ahead. Yes, so the, the postcard uh, actions with Last Chance Alliance have been going on since February, um, and we are hoping to send all the postcards in before our distribute day of action, which is on April 8th. Um, and we will be printing out the postcards and delivering them to Newsom's staffers uh, in Sacramento, and we're hoping to get thousands of postcards from all over California. Wonderful, wonderful to hear, wonderful to hear. So Alex, um, now as far as with this uh, letter writing campaign that has been going on since February, and I'm, I'm assuming that there have been thousands, hopefully there have been thousands of letters. Um, they're gonna be delivered to Governor Newsom's staff. Um, talk to us about any other rallies other than uh, this uh, lead up to April 8th. Um, there's, there's supposed to be the rally today. I'm completely confused. So please clear it up for me. Go ahead. Yeah, of course. Um, one thing I'd like to reiterate, uh, as Molly was explaining the postcards is that this is in, um, we're doing this in alliance with the last chance alliance. So there are lots of other organizations sending in postcards. As you mentioned, Sabrina, we're trying to have thousands sent. So, um, Supriya and California youth versus big oil can deliver them on April 8th. As for today, um, Supriya mentioned the Sacramento action with Pomo Save Our Homeland. Um, so that's happening in Sacramento and that is to support indigenous sovereignty. In the Bay Area, Youth Versus Apocalypse, who is, uh, which is a California Youth Versus Big Oil partner, um, they are having a people not profit march in San Francisco. So if you're interested in going that to that, that is at 10 a.m. So that's coming up pretty fast. And that's at Embarcadero Plaza. And that is to protest uh, the profiting from the destruction of our planet. So that's a great way to get involved, again, to support other youth-led climate organizations. Um, and Youth Versus Apocalypse is also, again, standing with this No New Permits um, as well. Our, uh, from what I know, I think their People Not Profit March aligns with this No New Permits demand. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. That is great. So um, now websites, uh, California versus, or excuse me, California Youth versus Big Oil dot org is that correct now people can put that into the google yeah so mm -hmm. it's sorry to interrupt it is ca youth vs big oil dot com that's where you can find a lot of our information we're also really active on instagram which is also the same uh same tag which is just ca youth vs big oil so you can find us there and you can also find our allies uh youth vs apocalypse and on Instagram and Last Chance Alliance on Twitter, which is Last Chance underscore California. Lots of information. I'm sure there'll be a description with um, links to check out, but those are some of our allies. Okay, most definitely. And yeah, folks, if you're connected with the social media and if you're, hopefully you're not social media adverse, dear listener, um, you can check it out on Twitter. I put it up on the, the Twitter handle, Facebook, uh, all over the place um, as far as this show is concerned, A Rude Awakening. So Priya, I wanted to, uh, let's expand a little bit more on what, uh, what you do as one of the founders of Fridays for a Future Sacramento. Um, do you have any new actions that are coming up? Um, maybe today, maybe next Friday. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? We got a little bit more time here, so. Yeah, so Fridays for Future Sacramento is a part of the global Fridays for Future movement. And that movement was founded by Greta Thunberg. They're really well known for doing school strikes. And so we are fighting for systemic solutions to the climate crisis. 
within the Sacramento area. And we will be helping to organize that action in Sacramento on April 8th. And we are also supporting the action in Sacramento on the 25th. And that is organized by the Pomo Land Back Campaign. And if you'd like to learn more about that action, the website is pomolandback.com, I believe. Yeah, or you can just go to Fridays for Future Sacramento's Instagram, which <laughs> is at Fridays for Future SAC, S-A-C. Wonderful, wonderful. And it is so wonderful to hear. And it is actually, yes, it is pomolandback.com, pomolandback.com. And um, it's an amazing, it's amazing what they have been able to do so far. It's also heartbreaking what they have not been able to do. Um, but uh, it's um, something needs to happen. So appreciate, I'm so glad that there are other organizations that are coming together with uh, Chairman Michael Hunter and his mother and his his people, uh, like the Coyote Band. Um, wonderful thing, wonderful thing. So we've got a few more minutes left. Um, let's see, how about we give a minute to Molly and a minute to Alex. Um, Molly, uh, now you're also, are you in Ventura? Are you down in LA? Or are you here in the Bay Area? I'm in Ventura County, um, which is a little bit ways from Los Angeles. Um, I got started in environmental activism with Climate First Replacing Oil and Gas, and I'm now working with uh, California Youth versus Big Oil. And I've been working on the No New Permits campaign, where we are pushing Governor Newsom to uh, stop all new fossil fuel drilling. Um, we believe that you know Newsom has shown willingness to move further on facing out fossil fuel production, but he sees Californians, um, you know, we haven't supported him yet in that endeavor. And so we'd really like Californians to speak up and um, fight back against fossil fuels in our future. Um, and we're hoping to mobilize uh, Californians all across the state and a bunch of youth as well. Right on. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I'm going to bring it back to Alex. Alex Massey, thank you for bringing these amazing people onto the show. Truly appreciate it. And taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us this morning on A Rude Awakening. Um, but if, are there any other uh, closing words, any other information uh, you need to uh, impart on the audience? Go ahead. You got about a minute and a half. Go ahead. Yeah, I would love to share with the audience sort of why we're focusing on no new permits and sort of like what's the reason for youth, for frontline communities, for Californians as a whole to care about no more fossil fuel drilling. So the science is clear and the stakes are extremely high for ending fossil fuel production and to address so many systemic issues as well as uh, ending or fighting climate change, we really need to end our reliance on fossil fuels and shift to clean renewable energy. And as such a huge economy, California is rightfully positioned to make this change and be a leader in ending fossil fuels um, in our economy in, uh, and everywhere in the state. And by committing to no new permits, as well as fostering renewable energy and protecting frontline communities through strengthening that setbacks ruling, Governor Newsom will be showing commitment to my generation, the young people that are going to be bearing the brunt of the climate crisis, and also those in frontline communities who are already seeing the effects of climate change, the effects of poor air quality and pollution and things like that. So if Governor Newsom commits to us, he'll show that he's committing to ending fossil fuels and ending the climate crisis in California and shifting away from dangerous, dirty um, production of energy and focus more on renewables. All right. Well, uh, we're going to have to close it out there, um, and unfortunately, but fortunately, because I will be having these good people back. Um, Alex, I appreciate you um, bringing these, again, bringing these folks to to the airwaves. Uh, Molly McCoy, Supriya Patel, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much for taking the time out of all of your busy schedules to to be on the show, to be on A Rude Awakening. And um, again, folks, you can go to the website and go to kpfa.org, go to A Rude Awakening. I will have Last Chance Alliance a website connection. I will have California Youth versus Big Oil a website connection. I will have and already have pomolandback.com. 
Gmail.com uh, website connection there. And they also have a GoFundMe, which you can find if you put it into the Google machine. It's called Support Pomo Land Back Rallies because they're needing some funding right now to uh, in order to keep this uh, GD uh, uh, Jackson Demonstration State Forest uh, actions going to save those forests. And uh, of course, you can yeah, listen to the show again. Get informed. I want to thank you, good people, ladies, for being on A Rude Awakening all together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Again, folks, today at 10 a.m., today at 10 a.m. at the Embarcadero Plaza, marching on Market Street to Black Rock and ICE Ice. This is a, an action, a global day of action uh, being put on here locally by Youth Versus Apocalypse. Hundreds of Bay Area students march to demand climate justice on this global day of action. Local elementary, middle, and high school students united demand hashtag people not Profit, hashtag people not profit, profit from Black Rock to ICE. And who's doing it? Well, again, elementary, middle, and high school students from around the Bay, joined by Youth versus Apocalypse and supporting climate and social justice organizations. And students and other activists will march through San Francisco, led by predominantly youth of color from frontline communities. And the students will leave red paint, handprints, blood handprints, Prince at the offices of the targeted corporation and immigration enforcement buildings to show how these groups are committing crimes against humanity, perpetuating violence, and failing to protect their lives and futures. And students are calling for specific measures, including that Black Rock stop profiteering from climate destruction, deforestation, and the violation of indigenous rights. And that they stop investing our teachers' pension funds in the fossil fuel industry. Students will march to the ICE building, a seat of injustice for immigrants and asylum seekers in the United States, many of whom are fleeing climate disasters around the world. And there, students will demand a pathway to citizenship and a respect of people's rights to seek asylum from within the U.S. And they ask that these groups support and listen to the youth present and take action for a livable and equitable future. Again, folks, that is today at 10 a.m. Starting at the Embarcadero Plaza, marking on marching on Market Street to Black Rock and Ice. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guests, Maurice Carney, Alex Massey, Supriya Patel, and Molly McCoy for taking the time. The music on today's show was No More War or War No More by Tommy Guerrero. Man of Steel, Roddy Keel is on the controls. I'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Stay tuned for a rebroadcast of Democracy Now! coming up next. And remember, good people, to embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all. Thank you for listening. San Dunbar Ortiz. The group made serious demands for five institutions to be established on Alcatraz. And why don't we have them yet? A Center for Native American Studies, an American Indian Spiritual Center, and an Indian Center of Ecology that would do scientific research on reversing pollution of water and air. A great Indian training school that would run a restaurant, provide job training, market indigenous arts, and teach the, quote, noble and tragic events of Indian history, including the Trail of Tears and the Massacre of Wounded Knee.
and a memorial, a reminder that the island had been established as a prison initially to incarcerate and execute California Indian resistors to U.S. assault on their nations. Advancing the conversation to abolish racism for over 70 years. 94.1 KPFA. A people who can believe that I was happy on the levee picking cotton, happy in the mines digging coal, and giving all this away to other people for their wealth, and unable to protect my house, my woman, my children. A people who can believe that I did this out of love for other people, and that I was happy doing it, and that all those songs and dances I learned while I was doing it meant that I was happy, can believe anything. James Baldwin, a voice synonymous with passion, integrity, and vision. No other station has been playing voices like these except KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FZ in Monterey, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.